And I'm glad to be with you today. I want to encourage you with something. It goes along with the prayer that time that we've just experienced. Uh, this week, when you, and I'm not just saying this, I, I'm asking you to do this. And the reason why I'm asking you to do this is because I believe the results will be in you something that I want you to come tell me about. When you do it and it happens for you, then I'd like to know that it happened for you because it encourages me and I love to hear victory take place in people's lives. But here, here's what I thought and, and felt about the worship. If every time you feel discouraged this week, Worship. Don't, don't complain. Worship. Every time you feel fearful this week, worship. Whether it's singing a line from a song, whether it's repeating a line from Amazing Grace or some other hymn. or something, Every time you feel the pressure of battle, worship. Every time you have a doubt or a concern, worship. It don't have to be long. You don't have to stop your car, get out in the middle of the intersection and, and do a, a holy huddle. I'm just saying, I just feel very strongly in my heart that God just wanted to, he's just given us a key. He said, if you put that key in and unlock what will come out of it. All right? Worship. When you're in that frustrated moment, worship. Praise him and see that he won't give you a different outlook, a different victory. Okay? Let's do that uh, this week. Uh, and let's share testimonies later. Uh, you can, uh, well, I'm going to be turning in several scriptures, but if you wanted to go ahead and turn to the first one, I'm going to get to in a little bit at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 is where I'm going to jump from. But this morning I want to I want to talk to us about growing pains. Growing pains. More specifically, I want to talk about spiritual growing pains. Now, let, let, me, let me just kind of remind you of something. Uh, spiritual growing pains uh, are a little bit different. In other words, just as we experience physical growing pains, how many of you, when you were a child, uh, or your, mus your bones or your muscles ache because you're, you're going through that growth plate time, I remember my mom having to come into my bedroom and rub the bottom of my legs and stuff like that when I was growing as a younger. You remember when you're going through growth, there are growing pains. Anybody remember that? Know what I'm talking about? As you get taller or, or and then as you get older, you also experience growing pains. You never stop experiencing growing pains. And some of you that are my age or older, you're like, yeah, but I'm done growing. I don't know how I'm experiencing growing pains. You're experiencing what they call growing old pains, okay? That's what we're experiencing. That's what we're experiencing, okay? But you never not experience growing pains, all right? And so spiritually, however, we also experience growing pains. But these growing pains spiritually have to do more with the way we live, changing the way we live, changing the way we think, um, breaking old habits for new habits, stuff like that. And, and so let me, I'm going to, listen, I'm going to put this right down on the basic level. I felt very, very um, uh, led by God to, to do this over the last few, few weeks. <clears throat> and so I, I want to take you to a very basic deal, okay? Um, so, so let me just start here. A lot of times, when we end our Sunday services, we end our Sunday services with an opportunity for anyone to respond to the message by doing what? Raising their hand. I know a lot of people go, well, why do you have to raise your hand? Well, you don't have to, but what raising your hand does <clears throat> for the shepherd is it lets me know that you are having a response time with the Word that the Holy Spirit has been ministering to you through the Word, through the preaching of the Word, through the singing of the Word, <clears throat> and you are acknowledging to me, number one, that you're having a response to the Word. The second thing that raising your hand does, even though you don't have to uh, do that, 
because God knows it, knows your heart. But the second thing it does is it puts you in a position of responsibility before God and the church family that you acknowledge that there's something in your life that needs to be worked on. Are you with me? And so, you know, a lot of times that happens. And, and, and so when, our, when we end our services with the opportunity for people to respond by raising their hands, uh, that the Holy Spirit is, is working with them and helping them show them that their life could be different if only they were willing to surrender that area of their life to Jesus. That's what this means. However, let's be real. Okay? Let's, let's, talk, let's just talk raw and real. Okay? Many times a person can feel like nothing changed. Right? They, they walk out the doors. I remember the night I got saved. I remember the night, uh, the other times I, I, I might have walked away from the Lord and came back. I remember that, that there were that feeling, there was something deep inside that felt different, yet by the time I got out the doors, I still felt like Mark, right? Maybe my temper or my, my negativity or, or whatever my brain is, I still felt like I'm Mark, okay? Anybody getting this? Well, what happens? Well, during the week, the devil hits you, and, and I would go as far as say the devil, if a hundred things happen to you the week after you make a commitment to the Lord. If a hundred things happen to you, I'm just going to just uh, facetiously say, there's probably only 30 of them that are the devil. The other 70 are you. <laughs> you know why? Because you've got old habits, you've got old hurts, you've got old hang-ups that are still a part of your life. Hello? Is this making sense? Is this truth? And so what happens? You feel discouraged. You feel confused. You even begin to doubt what you thought you committed to, what maybe you thought God did in you in that service, through that prayer time, through that worship, through that word. And they thought, <coughs> they thought that by raising their hand, everything would immediately be different. Well, it was, and it wasn't. Let's talk about that. I want to take the rest of our time and let the Bible explain to us what has changed when you might have raised your hand and what has not changed yet. Okay? That's what we're going to do today. So let's start with what has changed, okay? Now remember, I believe that this is the Word of God. The Word is inspired. I'm not talking about the men who, who wrote it down or, or, or translated it. The Word is inspired. This is His Word. I believe what He put in the hearts of man to write, and I believe it was the key to unlock what God thinks in heaven about your life on earth. What is his game plan? What is he working through? What is he trying to do? And this word is the treasure chest, and faith is the key to unlock it and all of its promises. Okay? So let's start with the very first thing. Remember, I'm not reading you cheerleading stuff. I'm reading you what I believe is the absolute truth from God's own heart and mind, okay? So, let's take you back. Whether you're 80, 90, 100 years old and you remember the day you raised your hand to receive Christ or whether you've raised your hand 15 times, okay? Whether, whether you come to church and you felt like it that day, you thought something changed in you, you didn't know, but something in your heart beat, something in your, in your blood pressure, all these things begin to happen. You begin to say, what's going on in me? What's happening in me? Am I hungry? What's going on? But it was a spiritual thing that you didn't know what was really going on yet. And suddenly you get out, so you raise your hand and say, okay, I think this is for me. 
<clears throat> and you say a prayer and you make a commitment and you walk outside and then the rest of that week you start feeling like, well, what's going on? Maybe I didn't get him. Let's talk about what happened. Okay, here we go. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, Paul writes, if anyone is in Christ, look at it, he or she, he is a new creation. He didn't say he's going to be, he wants to be, he will be. He said if, he's, if you're in Christ, if you've, yes, Lord, I know there's a change in my life that needs to happen. Yes, Lord, I believe by faith that you are the Son of God who died on a cross and was raised uh, for, my, for my sake, and you've made a way for me to know you eternally, and da 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 Yes, Lord, I believe all that. I don't know what's going on, but I believe all of that. If you have received Christ, he says that you are a new creation. In the moment, it's happened. Now he defines what's going on. The old has passed away. And see, the new has come. Now, let me break it down for you, okay? In other words, he says, because you have accepted Jesus as your Savior, something has changed in you. But there are other things that have not yet changed. Am I confusing you, or is everybody getting it? You, get, you still with me? Okay. When it says, he is new, he means that something has changed in you. Well, what is that something? Well, that something is faith and salvation have come to life in your heart. So, I don't have any here with me, but if I, if I have uh, coming around in next April, when I have seed, when I have butter bean, or I have, uh, I have corn seed or whatever, I have the seed, Okay. I do not have the harvest. I do not have the fruit. I have the seed. When I put that seed in the ground and everything around it ignites heat, moisture, nutrients, when it all hits that seed, it begins to germinate. When I said, Jesus become my Savior, the seed went in the ground. And what is beginning to happen is faith through salvation is now beginning to grow. And it grows up, pops through the ground, and it begins to continue to grow for its life cycle. Right? So faith and salvation, just like that seed in the ground, has now come to life in you. Something changed. The old that he talks about represents the way you used to live. And the new represents the way you, ready, will now begin to live. So if I put my corn in the ground, my corn seed in the ground, and it cracks through the ground, and I can see the little corn leaf crack, crack through the ground. If I called Lee, or if I called Gene and said, I got corn. And they'd be like, okay. No, no, really. I, I'm going I'm to pick it and bring you some. And they're thinking, okay, well, he planted, if, he was, if, he, if he's a knowledgeable farmer, he planted on Good Friday. It takes about 7 to 10 to 14 days for the corn to come up. It's only been 21 days, and this man's telling me he's bringing me corn. And I show up at their house, and what I've done is I've gone down my corn row. And remember, your corn's probably not this tall. And I've plucked them all out of the ground, and I've come to Lee and said, I wanted to bring you and, and down some corn. Gene's got the, look, he just did it. He did like this. And what y'all don't know, when Gene does like this, that means you've lost your mind, okay? You have gone cuckoo. If I take them the little tender shoots of corn, I have not yet got my corn, right? What's happening? The seed promise has broken through, but now it will begin to grow into what it's supposed to be. Are you with me? 
Okay. So the old represents what used to. The new represents the way you're now going to live. So what has changed? Now, remember, what I'm telling you has changed isn't something that you're going to go, yep, it's changed. It's inside. It's intangible. It's the spiritual things. Come on now, I want to make sure y'all are getting this. It, it's something that you're not, maybe not be able to put your hands on yet, but you know that you know that you know something inside is changing. Okay? So what has changed? Here's what has changed. Number one, sins. What do you mean that? What do you mean about that? I mean past wrongs, self-centered choices have been forgiven. Ain't nobody in here got a glory to God on that? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In other words, those sins are no longer held against you. Before you raised your hand or had that moment, whether you were riding down the road in a car or whether you were in your bed at night when the Lord ministered to you and you might not have raised a physical hand, I'm just talking about that from the church's point of view, but uh, when you have that moment before God when he, you can tell He is convicting you and changing you and you receive that salvation, what had happened before that is if you had walked in court, you were guilty and sentenced. And now you walk in court and the judge says, you have pardoned. Yeah, but you don't know what I did. I have pardoned you because you have laid your life before me and received me as your Savior. And so you now are forgiven. So those sins, the self-centered choices, let me tell you why you still feel like those sins are held against you. Because the devil's good at what he does. And here's the way that the devil wants you to continue thinking those sins are held against you. He wants to start sprinkling you with shame. He wants to keep sprinkling you every, every morning with guilt. He wants to sprinkle you every morning with, with uh, the fact that, that you're weak. He wants to sprinkle your mind every morning with something negative. But he's trying to distract you from the fact that Jesus has set you free because whoever has the truth of Jesus is free indeed. And the devil is a lie. The Bible calls him the father of all lies. He knows your sins are no longer being held against you. He knows that because you've declared Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that now you are a new creation. The worst phrases, that one of the worst top ten phrases that Satan could ever hear is this. The old is passed away. It's gone. He wants to keep us in the old, right? But your sins have been forgiven. That's the first thing that's changed. The second thing that's changed is this, faith in God. Suddenly, a gift, a gift, say it, a gift. I want you to know that it's a gift. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You didn't pick it out. It was just given. A gift beyond your own ability to equip you to make better choices, to persevere, to grow in the belief in Christ and His plan, faith in God, a gift has been bestowed upon you and it has come alive in you. Now, here's what the devil wants to do. He sees that little corn coming up out of the ground. What he sees that as is the faith coming to life. And here's what the devil wants to do. He wants to keep stomping down on your faith. And the most sickening thing that the devil can ever see is that faith, that little corn stalk, crumble and then start coming back to life. Crumble and continue to grow. That scares him to death. He wants to kill the faith of God in you from the get-go. But what has changed is the gift has come alive in you. A third thing that has changed uh, within you is salvation. In other words, the saving of your life eternally, but not just that. You do understand that the word salvation in the Bible, we have turned it into strictly a religious word. 
We think salvation has only to do with your soul and with eternity. But if you go read the word salvation in the Greek, you find out that salvation has a natural and a spiritual uh, definition that is intertwined. If it was only about the salvation of your eternal soul, here's what Jesus would have done. Every miracle that Jesus did, like the um, demoniac, the man who they said lived in the tombs, and they actually had chained him, to, they had rope, tied ropes on him, they had chained him, and the demons were so alive in him that he was able to break the chains, break the ropes. This was a man who would cut himself, try to kill himself. Uh, and, and here's what Jesus would have done. In the story, Jesus and his disciples are walking along, and the man comes running out of the tombs, and he smells, and he stinks, and he's, he's, he's just screaming curses and everything. And, and, it, and if you believe that salvation, as the Scripture teaches, is only about eternity, then here's what Jesus would have done. My son, your soul has been saved, so once you die, life will be good. But for now, you're going to have to be like you are. Hey, woman who's dealt with the issue of blood and has spent every minute of your life savings and now you're poor and you're still in pain, your soul is saved, but you're still going to have to deal with the issue of blood. Hey, blind man, your soul is saved, but you're still going to be blind. No, 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 no. Salvation that happens to you is not just about making you, writing your name in the Lamb's Book of Life for eternity. The natural definition of salvation is he will be with you in the trials, in the temptation, in the fires, in the storms. And he will save you within those things. You're the worst Pentecostal act of church I've ever seen in my life. I should have been seeing Tommy Ann run the aisles on that one. I should have seen a shoe fly. I should have seen somebody shouting hallelujah. Because I, I'm glad to know he has saved my soul. But I'm glad to know that when I get into the fiery situations of life, he's right there beside me. I'm glad to know when I feel like I'm sinking in the sand of all the weight of life, he's right there beside me. I'm glad to know that he's not just waiting for me in heaven, that he's right there with me, right in the middle of it. And it says, when you received him, Salvation is not just eternal. It's right there in it. He is there to naturally work into your situation. This gift given by Christ and then used to help you, here's the phrase, grow you up in your faith in God by the Holy Spirit. That's what's changed. When you've received Christ, internally, this is what's released in you. Sins are forgiven. Faith comes to life like, never, like you've never experienced before. And salvation begins to set you free <clears throat> into the new way to live. Those are things internally that have begun to happen. But you haven't seen it externally. So I throw that seed in the ground and I pat the ground uh, and wait. And I wait. And seven to ten days, I come along and I'm looking. Now, I don't know if Gene and Lee do this. I get this from my dear old dad. But when I plant corn, seven to ten days, I'll walk along. Every, now I start coming out every two or three days. I walk and I go, oh, there's one, two, three, four. So I count. And then the next day I come back and I go, one, oh, there's another one, two. So the first day I had 15, now I've got 21. And I count till I know how many came up. And you know why I know that? Because I know how many I planted. Because when I planted, I went along and went, one, two, yes, I do have that kind of rain man mentality. Okay? I count my toothpicks. Okay? Kind of thing. <laughs> so it is. But there are things that have changed in you. It's internally, I don't see it yet, but it happens. Please hear me out. When God first does a work in your life, you may not see all that he's doing yet, and the devil wants to make sure you don't see it. He wants to keep you distracted by temptation. He wants to keep you distracted by failures. He wants to keep you distracted by everything else because he doesn't want you to see what has happened internally. And here's what he uses. 
So I just told you what has changed. Now let's talk about what hasn't changed. What hasn't changed yet in a lot of folks is their mindsets. In other words, the way they think. What hasn't changed yet is their behaviors. They still cuss and chew and run around with people who do, okay? They still deal with some of that stuff, as we say, right? What hasn't changed is some of their friendships. Now, we should always be friends to people that are not Christian because we ought to be the light in their darkness. But as I grow in my faith, I'm spending more and more of my time with the body of believers. Why? Because my life has changed. And because my life has changed, I want to be with other people who have had changed lives as well. Right? But their friendships haven't changed. Their lifestyle habits may not have totally changed yet. But the Holy Spirit, through the Word, helps us learn to change these things. He helps us become more like Christ and less like the devil. Well, I ain't never been like the devil. Everybody in this room is like the devil. Matter of fact, the youngest baby in this church is like the devil. <gasps> you talking about my baby, my grandbaby? The youngest kid in this church is like the devil. You know how I can tell you how? Because before a kid knows how to talk, he knows how to scream and have a temper tantrum and shout for you to come get him up at 2 o'clock in the morning and feed them or for you to change them or for you to hold them and not put them down. They already know, before they ever know how to do 2 plus 2, they already know how to be like the devil. You know why they're like the devil? Because they're self-centered. They're self-serving. They're selfish. Now, that's okay for an infant. But if you're a Christian, you're going to be raising them up to know that those things aren't right things. But when you're as old as all of us in here are, and you're still self-centered, and you're still self-serving, and you're still selfish, to where you pout to everything that you don't get your way for every little thing, or you manipulate situations to make sure you get your way, or you give this, all of that stuff, let me just tell you something, you're being like the devil and less like Christ. Now, we all have flesh that we fight with that, but the truth is the Holy Spirit and the Word of God begin to help change our mindsets, our behaviors, our friendships, our lifestyle habits. He begins to help change that. Okay? So, let's, let's talk about it. I'm going I'm to try to, try, to, try to work through it pretty quick. I want you to write these scriptures down. I want you to read them at home. I want you to read them in here. So let's talk about our life that has to change, the things that need to change. So 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read you a few verses, okay? Just a couple of verses, but I want you to hear the thought process. I want you to hear the promise and the thought process about your growing pains, okay? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 through 15. Therefore, Peter writes, with your minds, he's already addressing mindsets, things that haven't changed. He's just started out right there addressing it. With your minds ready for action, be sober-minded. Set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Listen, verse 14. As obedient children, growing pains. Children experience growing pains. As obedient children, do not conform to the desires of your former ignorance, your old ways. But as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. Quickly, let me pick out a couple of phrases out of that scripture. Set your hope. In other words, folks, what he means is become committed to the truth of the gospel that you responded to. And all the crickets said, when he says, be ready, get your mind ready, set your hope. What does he mean? He means be committed when that, that when you heard or felt the Holy Spirit convicting you 
and moving in you and trying to change some things in you, be committed to the truth of the gospel that you heard and that you responded to. In other words, it wasn't a lie. It wasn't fake. It wasn't emotion. God called you. God convicted you. God convinced you that something in your life needs work. So be committed to the gospel that you receive. The second one, it says, do not be conformed. In other words, don't give in to the world's way of living. Don't go backwards when you get saved. Thirdly, he says, and this is one I like, be holy. Now, unfortunately, us Pentecostal type people, especially the denomination I was raised in, Pentecostal holiness, we always like to, to, to unfortunately, we like to take on that deal that, that if you're holy, none of us can live to be as holy as Miss So-and-so when she was there. You know, Miss So-and-so was 80, 90, 100 years old. Boy, I don't know how she got to be that holy, but I'm just telling you, I, just, I can't be that holy. We talk about holy, holy, holy. Here's our problem with holiness. We, we misinterpret holy. We, we assume that holy means perfect. And there's only one perfect holy. But when he says be holy in all of your conduct, conduct that means make sure you are cutting away, you are surrendering everything that stands in the way of you becoming Christ. Make sure you're working on that in your conduct. That's first, first Peter. It's not about being perfect. It's not about being better than somebody. It's about willing to surrender your life to the teaching and the leading God's Spirit. Let's, let's keep reading. Now, stay in First Peter. I'm talking to you about things that happen in your life with your growing pains. When you spiritually commit to the gospel, what does the scripture teach us to encourage us? He said, be committed to what you know God was doing in your life when you first acknowledged it. Now, what else does he say to do? Okay, 1 Peter chapter 2. You can read all of 1 Peter. He's going to tell you all this, but 1 Peter chapter 2. So he's just told you to set your hope, don't conform and be holy. Not perfect. Be working on it. Be committed to it. Then he says, here's the other thing you need to do. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, rid yourself of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Look, here we go again. He's giving you the same formula he just did in, in the first verses I read. Remember he said, like children? Here he says, like newborn infants desire the pure milk of the word. He's saying, you be like a newborn infant that desires the milk to grow. Y'all, I'm telling you right now, the greatest thing that will ever grow your spiritual growth, he's just told us. He says, like a newborn infant craves milk, you should crave the Word of God. The greatest thing beyond me receiving Jesus as my Savior, the greatest thing that God ever challenged me with was to know His Word. The greatest transforming agent in my life, changing habits, tearing down walls, breaking down wounded places, healing things, transforming things beyond my even comprehension was the Word. But I don't understand it. Oh, shut up. Read the Word. The reason you don't understand it is you don't read it. But it's old stuff. Yeah, so is your shoes in the closet. And you still wear them. Some of you are still wearing your high school shirt, and it doesn't fit, by the way. And you're still wearing it. Okay? Don't tell me those old lies. So what is he saying? He's saying, rid yourself of. That's my phrase for you. Not only do you set your hope, but you rid yourself of. Of what? Commit to the change you've accepted when you accepted Christ. 
And do that by ridding yourself of anything that is not good for you spiritually. <clears throat> Listen, if gossip isn't good for you spiritually, it isn't good for you naturally. Do you hear me? If lying isn't good for you spiritually, it isn't good for you naturally, in the natural, in your body. Because whatever happens to your body impacts your mind and the way you think, impacts your heart and the motives in which you think it, and the behaviors in which you do. So he says, rid yourself of these old things. Secondly, desire the word. You remember the phrase, milk does the body good? How about this? The word does your body best your spiritual body. It helps you grow. He actually used the words. It helps you grow up into your salvation. Those are Peter's words. And it means, what does he mean when he talks about, what does it mean to you grow up into your salvation? I thought once I got saved, I'm saved. Yeah, but listen, he's talking about salvation growing up in it. It's a very interesting phrase that he used in the Greek it's the process of continuing it's not I just got saved and, and now that's it and I can just sit back on my butt and, and do nothing and live like I want to no 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 he's letting you know there's more to that faith gets you to accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior but growing up into your salvation the Greek in there talks about the process of changing your life that that's saving your life in the physical how? Because growing up in your salvation means that you're understanding more about God. It means that you're becoming the best version of yourself by being more like Jesus. It means that you know how to fight off temptation, that you know how to overcome bad things, how to unlock the promises of God's Word in your life, and how to hear His voice and know His presence. Growing up into your salvation means that you're learning all of those things. So here's, here, here's how I want to end it. Here's how I want to end it. I want to take you one more place to read. One more place to read. We're talking about growing pains and what happens in you. What is it spiritually that happens in you when you give your heart to Christ? But then what is it that happens in the natural? What are the things that you can't see but believe by faith are happening? And what are the things that you can begin to see? So go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. And I'm going to answer a question. Pastor Mark. Why is this so important? Why is this important once you've received Jesus to know this? So let, let's talk about it. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. Listen, please know that what I'm reading, the opposite can happen as well. If you're not working at growing up spiritually. Listen to what he says. He says, I pray that he, God, that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power in your inner being through the Spirit. What's the opposite? That you would be weakened in your inner being without the Spirit. Come on. Let's keep going. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. In other words, that you would become assured that you are saved and Christ dwells in your heart. He said, this is what I'm praying for you. Here he goes again. I pray that you being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width and height and depth of God's love and to know Christ's love that surpasses all other knowledge. He said, this is what I'm praying for you about. That you'll be able to know how high, how deep, how wide God's love is. Well, we'll never know that. No, but if you're seeking it more and more every day, you'll get to heaven one day and you'll find it in deeper and wider measure. Let me, let me, let me just 
keep reading. Let's keep reading. I'm showing you the growing pains. I'm showing you why it's important for you to continue to understand that there are things that happen internally when you lift your hand and receive Christ, but there are also things that will happen in your life in the natural as you continue to grow up in your salvation. So let's quickly read. Let's quickly read Ephesians 4. Just drop right on down, Ephesians 4, and listen. I need you to listen to the words and what it means. Chapter 4, verse 11. And he himself, speaking of the Holy Spirit, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. In other words, he gave us spiritual gifts. Listen. Equipping the saints <clears throat> for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. Here you go. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with the stature measured by Christ's fulfillment. Keep reading, because if you don't do that, here's what he's trying to avoid. He's telling you, I want you to grow up in your salvation so you can avoid this, and we're living in this day. What I'm about to read to you is actually taking place in this country, in this world today. Then we will no longer be like little children again, tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into Him who is the head in Christ. Look at it. From Him, the whole body, fit and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. We are living in a day and time when everybody in the news is wanting to compete. Listen, it's a scary phrase. Wanting to compete with the techniques of deceit. In other words, these folks are sitting behind the cameras when they're not on, and they are talking openly about the right ways to use the right words to deceive us. And therefore, it emotionally tosses us back. One day we're happy. One day we're sad. One day we're excited. One day we're fearful. He says, I want you to grow up in your salvation to the point that you're no longer tossed about like little children scared of everything. That you learn to walk in the knowledge of who you are in Christ. That's what he says. I got to read you one more. Keep reading. That was 11 through 16. Keep staying in chapter 4. Go down to 20 and 24. And listen to the words. But that is not how you came to know Christ, as assuming you heard about Him and were taught by Him as the truth of Jesus. Take off your former way of life. The old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in the righteousness and purity of truth. We're back where we started. Taking off the old self, putting on the new self. We're back where we started. Something has changed when you accept Jesus. Something has changed. Know it and believe it in the faith that God is true to His Word. Something has changed. And yet, there are things about our lives that we need to work on. And with the help and leading of the Holy Spirit and God's Word, those things can change.
Stand with me. Here's how it starts. I'm ending where I began. We come to the end of the service. and We have shared the word. And the Holy Spirit is bringing revelation to people's hearts and minds all over the room. What he says, the truth that he reveals to this person may not be the truth he reveals to you, but he knows what each person in the room needs. He knows what each person in the room needs. He knows what each person in the room prays about, privately worries about, wrestles with. He knows all of that. And so when we preach the word, the Holy Spirit is, is we hope and pray, and we're doing our rights to do it, that he is moving throughout the room and he is speaking into your heart and mind about your life. And here's where it begins. The decision to make a change. Here's the last scripture. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So I want every head bowed. And I'm going to, and this is not just, listen now, if, you, if you're a Christian, you might think, oh, I could just tune him out. No, 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 stay with me. Because I'm going into the definition of salvation when I, when I make these requests. If you're in this room today and you do not know the Lord spiritually as your Savior, you've never accepted him, or you might have and you walked away and you've no longer believed. But today, somehow, some way, there's been something stirring in you to make you wonder about your life. And you want to receive Jesus as your Savior to begin immediately forgiving you of your sin, igniting the gift of faith in your life, setting your course in a different direction if you don't know him as your savior spiritually and you want to will you slip a hand up right now and put it back down just so I can see it and pray with you you may be in this room today as a Christian and here's where I'm getting into the, the definition you you receive Jesus as your savior Oh, I'm about to go somewhere. You received him as your Savior. But you struggle with letting him save you from worry, depression, unforgiveness, battles. For whatever reason, your mouth opens and complaining comes out or doubt comes out rather than what the scripture is that I just read that you believe in your heart that he is Lord and that God raised him from the dead he will save you in other words he will save you in the battle that you're dealing with you've already accepted him as your savior but yet you fail to acknowledge that the very God who raised Jesus from the dead is the very God who releases the spirit and the power in your life to bring breakthrough for whatever you need. 